For at TV, the world is thinking. Now, judicial restraint was the notion, judicial restraint activism. Activism is an insult. Somebody says you're an activist. That's supposed to be bad. Now, and, and judges don't like it. They don't want to be act. Nobody thinks he's an activist. Sometimes some judge may say I'm an activist, but if he says that, he means it in quotes as a kind of ironic comment. Where did it come from? I once had to give a talk. I looked it up. I'll give you a two-minute answer. When I looked it up, I discovered the term came from Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. in an uh, article he wrote in Look Magazine in 1948, where he was trying to describe the difference on the Supreme Court of that time between Black and Douglas on the one hand and Frankfurter and Jackson on the other. And that court, which was the Roosevelt Court, later the Truman Court, but they had been appointed at a time when the country really rebelled against the obstacles that the pre-New Deal court had thrown in the way of social legislation. And they wanted judges who would read the Constitution in a manner that permitted the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, it was the Commerce Clause that was the big problem then, but, 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 but in a manner that would, and Roosevelt thought this was right, the judges then thought it was right, give the legislatures an opportunity to enact social legislation that they believed was necessary. All right, so what was Arthur Schlesinger's Jr.'s historical origin of the word activist? He said these two views are the following. What Black and Douglas believe is, I think Thayer or somebody at Yale may have said this, he said, he who is least favored in life should be most favored in law. Now, that's a noble sentiment. I mean, there's something to that. You can understand why people might think that. But Frankfurter said, that is terrible. Don't do it. Because if you go down that road, your decisions will last precisely your lifetime, and somewhat less. Because that isn't a neutral way of deciding things. And you're criticizing the old court for favoring the rich, so you come along, you favor the poor, so somebody else will come along and they'll favor somebody else, and it just doesn't work. You have to have a consistent attitude. And that's where judicial restraint comes in. Judicial restraint comes in because people say that was the Frankfurter consistent attitude. Read the Constitution, and particularly in the economic and social area of giving the legislature very broad authority to enact what they believe their constituents want enacted. That's the origin of the phrase. Now, when else it has been used? It was used during the Warren Court by people who said judges shouldn't be managing school systems. Judges, oh, by the way, in terms of that first thing, probably everybody on the present court is pretty much judicial restraint. Okay. Now, uh, Warren period. Uh, judges shouldn't be managing school systems. Judges shouldn't be managing mental hospitals. Judges shouldn't be uh, managing prisons. Their job is deciding cases. We look around and judges are doing all of the above. That's activist. So when I spoke about this and I, I, I talked to a Chicago, uh, a group of Chicago law students, I got some pictures because I wanted to explain why that had happened. And I showed them a picture of a school in the South before desegregation. And I said, I'd like you to look at that. There's a shack, obviously. And then here's the white school over here. And now I'd like you to see what happened after 1954. And I've had a few pictures there of the Ku Klux Klan and uh, uh, what was going on. And I said, now put yourself in the position of the courts in the Warren period. They had said the Constitution means what it says. But nobody was doing anything. Congress didn't help out. The state legislatures didn't help out. The school districts were massively disobedient. So the courts had the choice of trying to do what they could or saying, forget about it. Well, that isn't a really tough choice. It's not a tough choice. It's a rather easy choice. And so now you can perhaps understand why they did their best, not always perfectly, but why they did their best in that period. Now I'd like to show you a picture of the mental hospital. 
that they took over, and I actually found one in Life magazine from the 50s. And my goodness, say, look at that. And now consider these words, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property, without due process of law. And look at that. And nobody's doing anything about it. All right? So can you understand it? And I read them the description of one of those prisons. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And now read the words in the Constitution. So we can understand it, can't we? We can understand it. Now, maybe it didn't always work perfectly. And maybe on some theory, judges shouldn't be doing that. But nobody else was. And they do have the Constitution. And they do have the situation. And so I say, I can understand that. But since that time, luckily, Congress has stepped in. And states have stepped in. And there have been lots and lots and lots and lots of water that has flowed over the, under that bridge. And, and we don't have that problem to the same degree anyway now. So I don't think anyone is worried about activism in that sense of activism. And then you have what you said. That's activism. I mean, activism in the sense of how willing are you to strike down laws passed by the legislature. And I guess you say, which I think I feel is true, is that Ruth and, and I have been among the ones less likely to do it. So on that measure, we're not very activist. And uh, uh, there we are. Okay, that's the best I can do on your question.